Hi there, the first part of this video was basically a marathon of finding and fixing one problem after another on this vintage Wayne B642 auto balance universal bridge until I was finally able to measure a capacitor. If you recall, the biggest issue left was that for unknown reasons one of the previous owners removed the power supply from the bridge and never put it back. Here's the schematic of what's missing. The circuit has a mains transformer which has three separate secondary windings. The top one is going through a full bridge rectifier, smoothing cap and then a stabilization circuit to produce plus 9 volts DC. I had measured the needed current of the 9 volt rail to be about 120 milliamps. The middle winding has a single diode as a rectifier followed by a smoothing filter and produces 200 volts DC for the neon lights. With my external 200 volt supply, I have measured the needed current by the lights was only about 2 milliamps, less than half a watt. The bottom winding goes to another full bridge rectifier and produces minus 6 volts relative to the common ground. The lack of any further smoothing on the minus 6 volts may be surprising. Until you realize that this is only used for the negative bias in the phase sensitive detectors and square wave generator circuit and that has its own smoothing in form of a 100 microfar capacity for the minus 6 volts on board. The needed current was minuscule at about 10 milliamps. This picture from the maintenance manual shows that the power supply was originally in what looks like a shielded box. This raises some concern in me how susceptible the measuring circuit is regarding stray fields and disturbances from the power supply. To find a suitable transformer with three outputs, one of them high voltage is pretty hopeless. One for two low volt outputs is much easier to find, but that leaves the question on producing the necessary 200 volts. The basic options are to find a separate small transformer that just produces high voltage. I considered a simple low watt isolation transformer, but that would produce 230 volts AC and even more DC that I would have to run through a voltage divider similar to what the original circuit did. Another option was to take a small AC transformer and run it in reverse, that is feeding its say 12 volts AC secondary from a 9 volt AC from the low volt transformer and then the primary may just produce the right height voltage to be rectified and used for the neons. In both cases the needed space for two transformers and doubling the stray magnetic fields prevented me from proceeding. In the previous video I had used a DC to DC converter to create a 200 volts for the neons. That converter is still available but expensive. I looked around and I found a much smaller and cheaper converter directly from China. DC 5 to 12 volts to produce a selectable output from 170 volts to 220 volts. It does not say how much current it can handle, but I need only 2 milliamps, so I decided to give that one a try. The listing even had a helpful diagram on how to wire it up, and for that price they even included pre-wired plugs for the input and output connectors. Of note, the minimum input voltage is now 9 volts instead of 5, but that's still ok. It also has a shutdown feature, which I don't need. The board arrived after 3 weeks and the polarity of the high voltage plug is the wrong way around. The second observation is that contrary to what the listing said, the shutdown must be put to ground to make it work, leaving it open or connected to plus causes the shutdown. But after taking care of these issues, the board works as advertised and that from just 6 volts input, drawing 10 milliamps with no load on the high volt output. To simulate the load of the B642, I decided to use an 80K resistor, which would cause a flow of 2.5 milliamps at 200 volts, but the board struggled to get much over 100 volts. That, however, was explained by my bench power supply going into current limit and reducing the input to just 4 volts, increasing the current limit to slightly higher than 131 milliamps. And the module had no problem to produce the 200 volts at 2.5 milliamps, which is 0.5 watt. And for that it needed 131 milliamps at 6 volts, which is 0.78 watts or about 64% efficiency. Not great, and the efficiency is better at higher input voltages, but for 6 volts this is acceptable. In a test run, the board had no problems in driving the neons, but 
The board was taking its input from the plus 9 volt from my external power supply and when I increased the sensitivity it was clear that the bridge was affected by the noise caused by the converter on the 9 volt rail. This was actually the best result after I had already added an LC filter. Before that the noise was much worse. To be true I don't blame this module because I'm pretty sure the same would have happened if I had connected my more expensive converter to the 9V rail but since that needs 12V input I had always used a third power supply for the DC to DC conversion in the previous videos. Why not replace the neons with LEDs? I decided to extract one of the neons on the sensitivity switch for some tests. The neons in that area are relatively speaking easy accessible while the ones for the G and C term are a nightmare just from reading the procedure to replace burnt out neons in the maintenance manual. I managed to find a socket for 3mm LEDs that looks pretty much identical to the socket of the neons, just slightly smaller diameter but still ok for the hole in the front plate if I add a washer at the back. And I also found some nice amber 3mm LEDs to go with it. I ran some tests to compare the neon and the LED version to settle on the current limiting resistor for the LEDs. In the end I decided that this was still a tad too bright and changed it to 2K driving the LEDs at 4.5mA on 9V. This is how my neon replacement looks. I considered adding heat shrink tubing as in the original wiring but I decided not because access is just too tricky and I don't want to blast hot air in there. Besides, there's nothing that might touch in the immediate area and now I'm using only 9 volts, not 200. All three sense neons are now LEDs. I noticed that the LEDs are a bit more directional, which means they appear brighter if they point directly at the camera, but it doesn't bother me at all when sitting in front of the bridge. I can put 9 volts on the 200 volt line to test the LEDs, while the remaining neons stay off, but putting 200 volts on is now out of the question. So no way back. All remaining 6 neons have to go. I start with the G neons because their access looks way easier than the C ones. Following the maintenance manual the first step is to remove the knobs taking care not to mix them up. Then the manual says remove the 5 screws and lower the G board to gain access to the neons that are behind it. I seriously doubt that this will be that easy. As a start this resistor has to be desoldered to allow any movement of the G-board. This is the best I could manage in lowering the G-board. At least the neons are visible and after what took 3 hours but only seconds by magic of video editing I had replaced the 3 neons with LEDs. The hardest part turned out to be losing the nuts on the neon holders and later tightening the nuts on the holders for the LEDs. Time for testing my work so far. The sensitivity LEDs still work of course, but now I also have working G-term LEDs. Nice. On to the last part, the C-term neons. First the easy step, removing the knobs and as before keeping them carefully to not mix them up again as the previous owner did. In principle it's all very similar to the G-term, 5 screws hold the C-board but Things are much more crowded here and some stiff cable looms promise that moving this board to access the three neons behind will be even harder than it was for the G-term. There are, for example, these two wires that run behind the large cable loom and prevent moving the board more than a few millimeters. No choice, they have to be desoldered first. Even with the wires desoldered, this is as far as I could drop the C-term board. It is much tighter than the G-term and there are lots of other wires in the way. After hours of work the C-term neons have been replaced. Because space is so tight and crowded with cabling there was no way to solder in that space. I had to snip the wires from the original neons and pre-wire the LED replacements using short extension wires that I then could solder to the original wiring safely away from all the other cables. Job complete and the boards are back in place. Previously desoldered wires and resistors are restored. I hope I did not break anything in the process. Well, with that work done, the job to replace the power supply has become much easier. A closer look on what's left of the original power supply. The power inlet socket with its two filter caps, the fuse holder and the voltage selector switch and then we have the hex standoffs for the original power supply PCB and the shielding cover. 
I removed the hex standoffs, all imperial threaded, not metric by the way, and desoldered the remaining wires and filter caps from the antique power inlet socket. I might as well replace that socket with a modern one. The available hole suggests an IEC C6 clover leaf or Mickey Mouse type could work without too much trouble. Well, almost. I need to just widen the hole a tiny bit on the left and right, which is, thankfully, quite easy in the relatively soft aluminium of the backplane. There, it fits and frankly I don't care that a little bit of the hole is still uncovered on the top and bottom. Later it will be dark inside and nobody's going to see that. With the score holes marked, all I have to do is drill two additional holes and the new power inlet is now permanently installed. I reused four of the original hex standoff holes to install new plastic ones that will hold the PCB for my new power supply. The circuit is relatively simple and straight from application data sheets. I'm using a small transformer that provides two 9 volt secondary outputs. Each output is rated at 1.6 VA, so about 170 milliamps for 9 volts. The upper one goes through a bridge rectifier, a smoothing cap and then an LM7809 voltage regulator to produce the plus 9V DC output. That works fine because 9V AC will produce at least 12.5V DC and on such a small transformer the nominal output voltage on low loads is normally quite a bit higher to allow for the high internal resistance of the fine wire. Even with a 120mA load the regulator still has plenty of headroom to provide a ripple free 9V. I would have done the same circuit for the 6 volts, but I had no dedicated 6 volt regulator, but quite a number of LM317s, which is an adjustable regulator. It needs a few more components, essentially the two resistors to select the output voltage. The other components are recommended by the datasheet to make it more stable and the diodes for protection. Since I had the space, I put them in, so this is exactly what the datasheet recommends. At the output, the positive 6 volts is tied to the 0 volt rail of the 9 volt, making the 0 volt of the 6 volt supply effectively a minus 6 volt output. Here is the finished circuit. The small heat sinks on the regulators are not really necessary, but I added them just in case. In fact, the whole thing is over engineered compared to the original power supply. The new power supply is in place and I wired the mains inlet. I put two safety caps in, similar to the filter caps in the original. I reused the original fuse holder and I also left the voltage selector switch in place, but it's now completely disconnected. The new transformer could still be wired for 115 volts AC, but that needs to be done on the PCB instead. Testing the power supply as installed, and we have near enough 9 volts and a nice minus 6 volts. The next step is to connect the power supply outputs to the terminal blocks where the original power supply wiring ends. It's a bit hard to see, but there is now a red wire bridge from the plus 9V to what was the old 200V input, because the neons are now all LEDs. In the original power supply, this whole area was under a shielding can and, while I hope I don't need something like it for electromagnetic shielding from my much smaller power supply, I don't like the exposed mains wiring that is very easy to touch accidentally while doing adjustments elsewhere. Therefore I decided to mount a simple piece of stiff cardboard over the dangerous area as a protection. I may eventually replace it with some more durable plastic cover, but for now this will do. And now for the first test under own power with the back panel up and the outer enclosure back in place. The lights appear very bright for the camera, but this is not the case for me. Most important, no interference at the highest sensitivity. Adjusting the C meter to zero, the G meter is already zero. In calibrate mode, adjusting the C meter for full scale, the G meter is still zero, so no calibration needed. Switching to auto and ready to measure. I have a 300 nanofarad cap for a test and I decided for measuring small components with a B642, these BNC to screw terminal adapters are ideal. Range 5 and the C meter shows just above 300 nanofarad. To get the next digit, I set the first decade switch of the G term to 0 
and the first decade switch of the C term to 3, I have now a very small deflection on the G term and a bit over 4, whoops, the needles all go back to 0 by themselves. That should not happen, something must have just failed. It's not the 9 volt power because the lights are still on. It turned out that the oscillator was dead, but a little later it was working again by itself. Since nothing was getting excessively warm and remembering the broken transistor legs from part 1, I suspect a mechanical issue, but the transistors were fine. But I found that one of the caps that determined the frequency was sensitive to being tapped. The other components were not, just this one. Even with a magnifier I could see nothing wrong on the soldering side of that cap, but I decided to reflow the solder anyway. This is the few after the reflow. And reflow did the trick. It's not sensitive to tapping anymore. I'm really glad because that cap and the identical one a bit further down is rather special. They are 13.250 nanofarad plus minus 1% silver mica capacitors and would be really hard to replace. I took the opportunity to adjust the mean oscillator frequency to be closer to the magic value of 1591.5 Hz. I only show a bit here as this is quite a laborious process because the adjustment is very sensitive. I tested the stability over 3 hours and this is the result. It turned out one should either wait 2 hours before adjusting or adjust a bit higher so that the oscillator will settle closer to the ideal frequency. As it stands, it settled at 1591.2 Hz, which is still in the tolerance of plus minus 0.5 Hz stated in the maintenance manual, so I leave it for now. Repeating the test with my 300 nanofarad cap, skipping the part that you already saw from the first attempt. So the first decade was 0 for G and 3 for C. The next decade is again 0 for G and 4 for C. This is when the oscillator failed last time. Continuing to the third decade and max sensitivity, we now have 0 0.02 on the G term and 342 on the C term. Adjusting the last decade for both, which are potentiometers instead of switches, yields the final digits for both terms. We have 0 0.026 millisiemens or about 38.5 kilo ohm. On the C term we have 342.9 nanofarad. Testing the same cap with my LCR meter at 1 kilohertz says 343.1 nanofarad and a parallel resistance of 102 K. I'm quite happy how close the capacitance is. The B642 says 342.9 not bad. The RP values are quite different. The RP is very frequency dependent. If I change the measurement frequency to 10 kHz, it drops to just 2.69 K. So one would expect that the B642 at 1.5 kHz shows a value lower than the LCR meter for 1 kHz, but much higher than the LCR for 10 kHz. To further demonstrate the scope of change in RP, at 100 kHz it drops to 43 ohms, while at 100 Hz it's somewhere in the 1.2 to 1.3 mega ohm range. The last problem, so far, is the missing class of the C meter. I tried many places to see if someone knew or had documents on how to open one of these meters made by Sangamo Vestron because all my attempts failed or caused some plastic to chip off. In the end I decided to try removing these plastic covers since that's about the only thing I hadn't tried. I guess with the right tool this may come out easily but they would not budge for me. I gave up getting them out intact and tried cutting them free instead. I dramatically shortened this operation for this video and I'm glad to report that I did not cut or stab myself in the process although sometimes it was a close call. And all of a sudden that stubborn thing flew just off. Oh, I see, Sangamo Vestron has thrown another obstacle in my path. It's not a normal nut, it's one of those security things that need a special two-pronged tool. Well, I tackle this problem once I get the cover of the other nut off. With the experience from before, the second cover stood little chance and the process was much faster. As expected, the same security nut is revealed. Let's see if we have the right tool for that. Of course not. 
The prongs need to be longer and thinner, so on to plan B, which works surprisingly well. And once the nut is sufficiently loose, I can just push it around with whatever is handy. There we go. The first one's off, on to number two. That one was tighter, but eventually gave in and let me turn it. From there, it was the same procedure that you already saw. I even found a security bit that worked once the nut was sufficiently high. With both nuts out, one can pull the bezel off while at the same time the transparent housing on the rear also lifts off. I did not capture this because I was still using the macro camera at the time, sorry. Anyway, I have the bezel and I can now glue the glass back in. The glass is glued back in. It's messier than I wanted it to be with some glue having squeezed out. I'm not terribly good at such things, but I will live with it. The clue was this one, not sure how well it will bond and maybe I have a chance to do it all over again soon, hopefully with less mess, but for now I go with this first attempt. After I gave the glue a couple of hours, I started the reassembly. The bezel clicks in. I decided to lift the rear cover off because there is some sort of an o-ring and that has four little taps that need to mate with four notches in the rear cover. I figured it's easier to mate the ring to the cover while the cover is off because I can see the notches better. All very fiddly, but I think I managed to put the cover back on with the o-ring still in the right position. Now the nuts need to go back on. That one goes reasonably well and I can easily tighten the nut by pushing it along. Same process for the nut on the other side of the meter of course and also pushing it along until I can't turn it anymore. To tighten the nuts a bit more I use a knife. I don't want them to be super tight yet because I first want to test the meter. I use the same setup I used in the first video to drive an adjustable current through the meter. It seems to work until the needle hangs at half scale. This is what I was afraid of and why I didn't tighten the nuts. But after exercising the needle a few times, the problem has gone away. Okay, I take that and hope it stays away. If not, I know now how to get that meter open again if needed. And there it is, finally, with everything repaired and working as far as I know. Doing the usual alignment after power up and the newly class covered C meter seems fine. Next would be alignment and calibrations. I did the oscillator already. But there's more of course. To find out if a general calibration is needed, the maintenance manual has an accuracy verification procedure. First the G-term. The manual says I need a 1K resistor that is 0.01% accurate. I have a standard of 0.02% resistors and this is what the 1K reads on my in calibration 3441A using two wire ohms with nulling the wire resistance. I think that's good enough. The bridge is aligned, set to range 6 and I connect my 1K that you just saw measured. Immediately the G term goes to 10, in fact it's slightly above 10 when ideally it should be exactly 10. Let's measure what the G term is following the usual procedure. 10 on the first G term digit and 0 on the first C term. 0 on the second G term and 0 on the second C term. 5 on the third G term and I have no choice to use 1 for the C term. This makes the C term negative which means this resistor has some inductance. Not a surprise because this is a wire one type. I can balance the G term to 0 by turning the fourth digit to 4. There is not much I can do on the C term but I'm not interested in that anyway. The G term reads 1005.4 micro siemens which is 994.63 ohms an error of 0.54% which is small but more than it should be because the bridge claims 0.1% accuracy. For the C term the manual asks for a 100 nanofarad cap with 0.01% tolerance pretty much unobtainium if you are a hobbyist on a tight budget. I have a cap that measured 91.92 nanofarad on my LCR meter and as expected the C term needle is a little above 9. To get the complete capacitance, first digit 0 on the G term and 9 on the C term, second digit 
0 on the G term and 1 on the C term, third digit, fourth on the G term, and 9, or rather 8 on the C term. For the fourth digit, the G term balances to 0 at 2, and the C term somewhere between 4 and 5. Let's use 4. That gives a capacitance of 91.84 nanofarad, or 0.09% lower than my LCR meter. This now becomes a question of accuracies. The LCR meter specs for this measurement are 0.5% plus 5 digits. So the real capacitance, taking tolerances and digits into account, could be somewhere between 91.41 and 92.43 nanofarad. The B642 claims 0.1% accuracy, so from its result, the true capacitance could be somewhere between 91.75 and 91.93 nanofarad. To visualize this, I plotted both ranges, and it's clear that the B642 result lies smack in the middle of the tolerance field of the LCR meter. If the B642 would be way outside, left or right, there would be a case for recalibrating. But as it is, this graph is exactly what you would expect from measuring the same capacitor where the B642 is five times more accurate than the LCR meter. Unless I somehow get my hands on a 0.01% capacitor, I should not touch the C-term calibration. I may have a look at the steps to get the G-term calibrated, but I'm not sure when I get to it. If that would be a good video, and most importantly, if anyone would even be interested in a part 3, please let me know in the comments. If you like my videos, don't forget to subscribe. There are many more projects, repairs and reviews coming up. And it would be great if you decided becoming a Patreon. That would really help this channel. Thanks for watching.